record now. And the topic for today, today's office hours is living in community. We're going to talk about cooperative housing. Uh, we're going to talk about co-housing and we're going to talk about co-living. I did just hear from Norm, Norm, who is in Lake County, Florida right now. Uh, he is having trouble finding uh, some secure Wi-Fi. He is kind of our, he was our, our main person to talk about cooperative housing. So we will mention that, um, talk about it maybe a little bit, but neither Kate nor I are experts on cooperative housing. If there are people on the call who uh, are, uh, have, have experience with cooperative housing, um, that's awesome. Like, well, let's bring you into the conversation in a major way. Uh, what Kate and I have experience with is co-housing and co-living, and so we'll be talking about, about some of that. Um, in fact, maybe one of the, the first things that we can do is to, um, oh, yeah, Living in Community by Christine Pohl, great book. Uh, Elliot, uh, did you see that she she died recently? Like she passed away a couple weeks ago. No, no, I didn't. Um, yep, yeah. When we, uh, so we had I, I don't know if, if folks know, but I wrote a book back in 2014, co-wrote a book uh, called Slow Church. Um, uh, and uh, we had a conference in Indianapolis in the Inglewood neighborhood where my co-author lived. And we had a number of really great speakers who came in for this conference. And Christine Pohl was one of them. And I was able to hang out with her for a little bit. We've kind of stayed in the same little uh, guest house on the, the church campus. She, that's an amazing book. It is written from a, a, a Christian faith perspective, but still super, super valuable. Um, yeah. And she did just pass away just a couple weeks ago, which was yeah very, very sad. Um, so let's start by kind of defining some terms and I'm going to take a crack at cooperative housing. Actually, before I do that, hands is hand raised. Does anybody here have awesome experience with cooperative housing and they can be our resident. Oh, Elliot, perfect, cool. All right, and Eric as well. All right, cool. So would one of you or both of you wanna take a crack at defining like what is cooperative housing? I, okay, I'll, I'll try it out. So cooperative housing is a form of organizing our real estate around living instead of around asset ownership. Interesting. And what does that what does that look like practically? Like are people kind of buying into a property? Are they like buying like buying into a, a, like a, a corporation? It could be. It, mm -hmm. it could be uh, like in my experience was actually more of as a renter, renter okay, as yeah. a renter. But uh -huh. but yes, abs absolutely. But in either case, instead of it being a business model to generate revenue through rental income or to generate ca uh, capital appreciation through the appreciation of a real estate asset. It's a, a purchase made instead for the purpose of supplying housing to a group of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I'm great. An I have a degree in uh, econ from Minnesota. So like, that's, that's kind of like, so it's a, it's a, I'm a banker, so it's kind of like a financial e economics mindset. That's 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 my definition. That's great. Uh, Eric, do you have anything you'd add to that? Yeah, I'd add to that that it is explicitly um, non-capitalistic, or usually is explicitly non-capitalistic in that the goal isn't, as as Elliot said, um, appreciation of value. The goal is uh, collective home ownership and collective ownership of the housing. Instead of it being owned by one person, it's owned by a collective of people. Um, in the college co-op I was part of, um, we collectively rented houses in the town uh, because we didn't have you know, the money to buy a house. Um, and we crammed a bunch of people in there, but it was not simply about the ownership structure. It was all about the communal living as well, which is I think similar to um, the other types of housing talk about later. Mm -hmm. uh, some, sometimes it takes the form of shares in a corporation. I think that's largely the case because that's the model that the rest of society has and everything is required to fit into that mold, even if it doesn't quite fit perfectly. Yeah, that's helpful too. That's helpful too. I, so this is something that Norm, Norm is, uh, like he, he and his family currently rent a house, um, but it, he, they live in uh, a suburb of Vancouver, British Columbia. And as 
all of you probably know, like the, the, the cost of housing is, is just insane there. And so he is on the board of like a, uh, of a cooperative housing advocacy group. And he is, I'm, I'm almost certain I'm, I'm this was the, the plan. I think it still is like he's getting together with a group of people to actually form a co-op um, to, to build something together. And so he uh, has a lot to a lot to say and a lot to um, offer about that. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to hear from him, if not today, then at some at some other point. Um, Kate, I'm so again. So if you actually joined a little bit late, uh, I'm really happy because uh, my wife, Kate, is with us on the call today. Um, Kate and I have lived in community with other families for a number of years. And so, Kate, before we kind of talk about our personal story, would you talk about co-living? And co-housing, how like and what the what the difference is between those two things? Because we used to call what we do co-housing, and we realize now it's actually actually co-living. So can you can you define those terms? Sure. Hi everyone. Um, my name's Kate, and I am John's partner. We um, live in Silverton, Oregon, with another family. So like John said, we've been doing some version of co-living uh, for many years. And it first started out with uh, a couple, we usually call them the older couple because they're about 15 years older than us. We have the older couple and we currently live with the younger couple. They're about 15 years younger than us. And when we moved in with them, um, what we are doing was actually co-living. So that's really where you have uh, multi-generational or different family units or relational units, basically people who are unrelated in most cases. You can do it with relatives too, if you wanted. Um, live together cooperatively in a shared space. Oftentimes that can take the form of people co-owning together, or you could even have renters together in a space um, that becomes a little bit more like, you know, roommates. You could think of co-living is very common in certain like generational brackets around college age and right after like young um, adults who are out in the world usually before they're married and whatnot. But we did this actually when we were married and as we started having children. So we moved in with an older couple who had a large house and extra space. And we were living in a small town where rent was high and we could then afford to live in town with this other couple. And we were renters while they were owners. And this couple had the vision for developing part of their property um, into a co-housing community. So we were using the language of co-housing for a long time, but co-housing is different in most cases from co-living because in co-housing communities, you typically have um, an organization of folks who have come together to buy and de either develop or buy up property and have single family homes or multi-generational homes, or you can even have apartment type buildings where folks live together, but they typically live in their own private dwelling. So it's not necessarily a communal home space, but you might have smaller homes with private restrooms, private kitchens, private living spaces. Um, but then there's usually a shared common house or a shared kitchen space where folks can come together and enjoy the benefits of communal living through shared meals or you know decision making for the property and those co-housing communities typically are like condos in their, their association with an HOA so that's really common and like the big overview and co-living tends to be more shared house shared space which with much more intimacy and of course there's different levels of what that can look like. So in our family situation now, what we've done is um, our older couple's uh, dreams came true and they were able to <clears throat> buy some property behind their house and do some subdividing and whatnot and develop a small co-housing community with 11 single family small homes, not tiny homes, but small homes with a common house. And that is now right behind the house that we bought from the older couple. So we're kind of like honorary members in this co-housing community, although we're not part of their HOA. And we now co-own 50-50 with the younger couple, the house that we live in. So it's a single family home with two families living communally 
where we are equal owners and have equal ownership of the mortgage and the house and live there very collectively, very communally, where we joke often, we share everything but the bedrooms. <laughs> so we eat all of our meals together. We share the living space together. We kind of cooperatively and find ways to like co-raise our children together. We have some shared bank accounts in order to manage the life of the house. So we share a grocery account. We have a house savings account. We have a house expense account. And all of those are shared together um, where we do very much shared decision making. And it's, you know, easier. It's very um, consensus based decision making, but it's really just, you know, four adults making those decisions together. But that's the gist of it. Our family has two children ages nine and 15, and the other family now has young children. So they've started the process of having children while we live together. They have a two and a half year old and a three month old. And so that is a huge benefit. You know, I, Ezra Klein just did a podcast on, you know, radical community living and communes. And it's so true that across our country in the U.S., uh, I would say probably North America generally, when you're talking about the U.S. and Canada, you see a lot of folks living very independently at this stage of life, where now they're starting to have families and be married or coupled and going out, living, you know, independent lives and doing it all on their own during this very intensive time of raising children and trying to figure that all out where um, this way of choosing to live is, you know, maybe just like a little bit more ancient and um, I would say natural where you're sharing the life together and having many hands and many eyes doing the work and the life of the house. So that is my big overview of co-living versus co-housing and a little bit of our infused story into that. Thank you, Kate. Uh, we have um, an email that we will send out, that Norm will send out um, with some resources that will come up over the course of this call. Uh, one of the, so I'm making some notes as we go along. Kate mentioned the older couple that we started co-living with who built the co-housing community right behind us. Uh, the, the, the wife in, of that couple, Lisa, was interviewed by Rachel Quednow on the Bottom Up Revolution last year, the year before, about the process of building the co-housing community right behind us. That I will, I'll include a link to that uh, interview. I'll also include a link to an article that I wrote kind of about our, our family's living situation and living with, with another couple uh, that will kind of give uh, some more context. One of the questions, though, that did come in is just about how we how we kind of got into this living this somewhat unusual uh, li living arrangement. I like to say that <clears throat> almost from the beginning of our marriage, Kate has kind of uh, dragged me kicking and screaming into the things that would end up being some of the best, most important things in my life. And so I remember when we were dating 20, you know, 20 plus years ago, oh, and then I write books about them. It's very unfair. Um, like 20 plus years ago, Kate, when we were just dating, Kate said, you know, someday I want to live in an eco village. And I said, no way am I interested in that. Uh, I'm an introvert. Uh, I like space. I like privacy. I like quiet. Um, the idea of sharing space, uh, just was not interesting to me. Uh, and so then to, to have started this, uh, 10 years ago, something that would be just like one of the most amazing blessings of my life is, um, it's, it's pretty interesting. And then uh, even when we were living in Portland before we started uh, co-living for real, although we kind of did it there too, uh, Kate said, I want to get to know our actual neighbors. And I was like, what, why, you know, why do we want to get to know our neighbors? And then I ended up writing a book about it. Uh, so anyway, Kate's the real brains of the operation here. And so Kate, maybe if you could tell just a little bit of our story, kind of how we ended up co-living in the first place and why we were drawn to that. Yeah. So um, I don't know if this really plays into it, but I grew up in like the Tahoe National Forest of, you know, California, and it was very rich with a lot of arts and it, there were intentional communities there and probably just a lot of hippies. So my childhood was like infused with these visions of communal, I don't even know what communal life communes even, uh, but somewhere in that journey, 
through childhood to young adulthood, I just really had a deep desire to live collectively. So I'm on the scale of collectivist versus individualist. Somehow I ended up being way more collectivist. And um, as that took shape and started exploring the internet, somehow I came across Dancing Rabbit Eco Village, which is like one of the big ones in the US and started following their story and then reading different resources that they put out and really got enamored with the idea of living that way, which opened up a lot of the knowledge around you know, eco villages to co-housing communities to just different ways of living. And I think gave me an imagination for some of my longings of who I am. So when we got married, as John said, I shared a lot of these things with him and desired for that. And an easy way to do some of that way of living was just literally getting to know our neighbors, you know, walking out the front door and making sure we know who's here and who's there, um, cooking extra food and sharing that with neighbors and just building that community. And when we moved to our small town of Silverton, uh, we started meeting folks and one of someone made a connection said, oh, you need to meet this woman who was Lisa, who was the um, part of the couple that we moved in with. And somehow in our very first conversation, I said, this is who I am. And I like eco villages and have a dream of living in something like this one day. And she said, oh, me too. And so that's really how that started. And we have this vision where, you know, if this property opens up, we're going to buy. So they, what they did is they started in one house and they bought the three over time. And it just all worked out in the matter of five years that the two houses on either side came available. And so they were able to buy those houses consecutively, like one at a time and subdivide the back lots off. And this was their big dream because this was basically like a whole block of property where these long lots, they were basically triple long lots. Um, with no developed property behind them. So they were able to do this and be able to then subdivide that up and then convert it and do the whole development process for co-housing. And part of their process was inviting us to live with them and start practicing what they dreamed of, of more communal living. And so it was a big adventure for both of us to do that. And um, John's first step really into trying that out um very formally so yes of course you know like I'm like the instigator and the dragger if you would um John maybe is more hesitant but he's very much full participant and I'm glad he's the writer because I'm not the writer that doesn't work out in our in our relationship so it's a good, it's a good arrangement yeah um I saw that someone asked a question about uh budget and bank accounts um yeah, we can totally talk about that if anyone wants. Uh, we can get into that next. But did I answer, John? Did I cover enough of what you'd uh, asked? Well, maybe I'll just I'll, I'll just kind of bring it up to present day. Mike and Lisa, the older couple building the co-housing, they were going to sell us, Kate and me, the house. At this point, we were we had the younger couple living with us as well. Um, Emily and Elijah are their names, and uh, Kate and I were just going to buy the house. And then continue like Emily and Elijah would rent, but we all still wanted to live together. And Emily and Elijah actually came to us and they said, what do you think about buying the house together? Because we, we never want to not live with you. And Kate and I kind of looked at each other and we said later, it, it was almost like we were being proposed to. Um, like we had already just absolutely like kind of like fallen in love with Emily and Elijah. Um just like they are kindred spirits. They have such a, like such a neighborhood mindset. We had years of experience living with one another, kind of like, um, you know, working out some of the, some of the challenges that come, come with co-living. And um, so it was just a, a really amazing experience to realize yeah. that. Go ahead. Kate, John, go. I need to say one of the things they said though, was I could see us, we can see doing this even when we're 65 and 75. And that, again, is like you see a lot of co-housing communities being multi-generational, but often they're starting with folks who are older um, in a whole different stage of life and then hoping for younger families to come into it. And for me, looking ahead, knowing that we could live with people who were 15 years younger than us and who wanted to live with us when we were 75 years old is huge. That's like life house investment maxed. You know, mm -hmm. like we're going to have 
these people who know us, love us, who we've invested with together, um, who then also get to kind of like keep it real and keep us young and also help us out, you know, like a single family home caring for one on an almost quarter acre lot is a significant amount of work, even for four adults who are fully able-bodied right now. I can't even imagine what that's going to be like when we're 75. Mm. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to live with them. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. And, you know, this is something I've talked about in the articles that I've written for Strong Towns, as well as the Upzone podcast that I did about co-living last year, I believe it was. Um, You know, Silverton, because of its proximity to Portland, the, the housing market here is is pretty bonkers actually. And so Emily, Emily is a nurse and Elijah is a teacher. The two of them grew up in Silverton, but they could not afford to buy a house here if they had not gone in with us to buy one 50 50. And so there are fi- practical financial benefits to co-living as well. Like we're splitting the cost of the mortgage, we're splitting the cost of maintenance, we're splitting all of these costs, which then gives us the financial flexibility um, to save more, to be more generous, all of these other things. And maybe we can get into that as well. But um, there are like there were practical benefits for Emily and Elijah as well as for, for our family. Um, but Kate, yeah, let's what was that question that you saw about about budgeting? Oh, oh curious about your budget process for four adults when so many fo- folks struggle with a budget with just two. Or, or, yeah. uh, or even just one adult. Well, you, you want to talk about that, how we do that as a, as a household? Yeah. So when it started out, we just, John and I have been on a journey um, to figure out how to budget and manage our own finances, you know, since we've been married. And we had a general sense through our budgeting process of how much we spent every month on groceries. So that's like a really easy first place to start. And the other couple kind of had a sense. And so we just literally said, well, let's start with that and put our money in and your money in to one bank account. And every adult has a debit card and we would start grocery shopping. And so over the years that evolved where we would have to fine tune and tweak that. We've learned that November, um, December and other months, there's a couple other months are much higher when we have like, cause we do rituals around, you know, different holidays or birthday dinners. So if there's like a big birthday month, you know, like we end up spending a lot more money. But we all keep track of that and touch base on a regular basis, like what's how much is in the account. And we've also developed some really clear like rhythms around who's doing grocery shopping and what those lists look like. So we literally have a spreadsheet where we manage our Costco list, where we manage our other grocery store list. And then they're in between. And inevitably, what is it? It's the 21st of June. We have $3 <laughs> in our bank account, but we're all on it right now. And we're like, okay, so we have $3 in our bank account, but the or pantry account, is yeah. full. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, in the grocery bank account. Um, but the pantry is full and the garden is starting to produce lettuce. You know, like we're going to have to be creative, but it's also nice because we have four adults and children to help foster that creativity. And we desire to live simply and to live within our means, but it's also the 21st of the month and we spent all of our grocery money. So we'll have to have a house conversation at some point because we're gonna need some more money. So we'll figure that out. Um, And it just like always comes back to, first of all, we have that foundational relationship that's built on trust and a lot of communication. So we try to get together and talk as a house every Sunday morning. And of course in between, but those Sunday mornings are that intentional time where we get together and talk about the life of the house, where we make decisions, we bring up concerns or like those rubbing points where it doesn't feel so good and try to work through it quick and get get there. So um, that's like our grocery account. We also, of course, put in as much money as we need for our mortgage and utilities and ongoing regular expenses into our house expense account. And so we put in all of those things plus an additional $50 per couple that cover incidentals, things that just come up that you have to buy. And we try to maintain that bank account with a $500 cushion at all times so that everything can be pretty much automated, but we check in with it. Um, We try to keep track of our utilities and keep, I keep like a three month running average 
so that we can see like are is what we're putting in reasonable right now is it working so lots of spreadsheets lots of communication and just being really honest and um trusting with each other you know we're all in this for the sake of our families flourishing and for this house being maintained and for our future um for our children and so starting with that and just regular communication really makes it um practical you know speaking of that kate uh, are, do, are you okay if i keep yeah. you're much more articulate than i am so i'm just going to keep asking asking you these questions um Somebody asked, how do we handle conflict and disagreement? And a lot of that ha happens on those during those Sunday morning check-ins. So do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So first of all, we call them now, we call them fireside chats because that sounds fun. Um, sounds better John than meeting. Right. We've learned the importance of what you call things and like name it because getting ready for a house meeting sounds formal, might provoke some anxiety, especially if you've been involved in other communities that maybe weren't very healthy or just like work, right? You go to your meeting and it might even just be boring. So we call them fireside chats and we sit in our living room next to the fireplace, which sometimes in the year actually has a fire going, but usually does not. And we just do a check-in. So we usually do a four adult check-in, like, where are we? What's going on? Like, what? where are we emotionally? And so that gives us kind of the the weather forecast of what we're entering into. Sometimes folks will kind of precede, um, this is what I'd like to talk about. So we we don't really have an agenda, but sometimes over our group text, we'll say, hey, I wanna talk about, um, we just had one where it was like, I wanna talk about the, the watering system for our yard. You know, We wanna to move toward drip irrigation in certain portions and that's gonna cost money and time. So we need to talk about that. So we all knew going in that was gonna come up, but sometimes, there's relational challenge and conflict. And so we have to really get into those pieces. And, you know, again, it comes back to that trust and being really honest with each other. We try really hard to just do that timely. So when something is coming up, either doing it on the spot where you are or waiting for our house meeting and trying to work it out there. And um, we use the tool, the Enneagram, as a really helpful tool for us. If you don't know what that is, you can just Google the Enneagram. It's like Myers-Briggs or whatever, and all those different personality types. Um, it really helps us understand some of the motivations or ways in which another person might receive or understand something or the lens they're gonna see the world through and or help us with rhythms and who to talk when. So I, my personality, I'm like very black and white. I'm an Enneagram one. Um, I'm very black and white. I tend to be very like logic. And I also tend to be like a fixer. I'm going to make it right. And we're going to like get here and do this thing. I also am really much like the first person to talk and answer all the problems. But in our house, like relationally, one of our other housemates is an Enneagram nine. And if we don't prioritize Elijah being able to speak first into a situation, whether it's conflict or any ideas, ideation or solutions, or like, just what do we want to do? Um, he'll just like go with the flow. And so we've learned as a house using this tool to like ebb and flow in the right rhythm, but also to draw out and call out other folks and have appreciation for, you know, if someone is always approaching something from like a scarcity or a fear space not to like take that personally, but to draw out understanding and then also kind of speak into and encourage and build up um, other ways of looking at a situation. Sometimes um, I compare co-living to being inside a rock tumbler. And it means because you're, and I would say this is true just of life in the neighborhood. It doesn't even have to be at the level of the house, but the life of the neighborhood, it's like being in a rock tumbler and you're sort of like constantly kind of like, bumping up against each other, clicking and clacking and all this kind of stuff. And it can be uncomfortable sometimes, but truly like you end up becoming a better version of yourself over time. Um, or at least that's been our experience. Uh, and it's like being in that rock tumbler, as I said, is uncomfortable, but eventually like you really start to shine and we have a, a painting that a, a friend of ours did in, in our house and it's 
Um, and it has, includes a quote from my favorite writer, Wendell Berry, who said that it is not by ourselves that we learn to be better than we are. And that has been our experience, both in the neighborhood and in our house. Uh, that is, you know, we, it's not just being on your best behavior, but it's almost like viewing your behavior through the, through the, through the lens of others who are watching you. Um, uh, and, and, and lots of things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, another question that has, that has come up um, is about, actually, let's, maybe we can talk about, about kind of the, the, the finances. Um, Kate, do you know enough about how they did the finances with the co-housing neighborhood behind to really speak into that? Or should we keep it with what we're experts at? Um, I can do very, very high level. I okay. think they started out with an LLC to buy the property. And then in the, pr in the process of that, um, the LLC bought the property and there were multiple like investors, you know, people who bought in and like seeded with a certain amount of money. And it was a lot of money up front, which again, like made it very hard for young folks just yeah. to like join in if you they wanted young people. folks, but they needed people who had already kind of made their fortune, unfortunately. Right. You know, who were like selling a house and then doing whatever. So um, once they built all the houses, they worked with, um, people, you know, lawyers and stuff who have all the expertise in this type of conversion, they converted the property with all these different homes into a condominium association structure. So um, that's my very high level understanding. Mm -hmm. And so now everybody, they, co they own their own individual condo, basically their house um, with the little land that's right there. But um they pay into an HOA and they have through that HOA, it, that's what manages like the co-housing agreements. And so if anyone else were to buy into the HOA, buy into the condo association at this point, buy one of those houses, they would basically be agreeing to live into the HOA agreements. How would you describe that ownership structure that we have at our house? Um, we have... Like on our title, you know, like our house is, well, we have a mortgage. So there's that. So our mortgage has one person from each couple on the mortgage. And we did it that way only because at the time, um, I think John had just started with, no, you hadn't just started it with strong counts. I can't remember. Oh, you, well, anyway, there were reasons why with between that and Emily had just left her job um, that we just have one person from each house, like each family on the actual mortgage itself. And that worked out in our um, our favor for interest rates and whatnot. So we co-own co the mortgage in equal parts. So we're both named on it. And then the house itself, the title has all four adults listed. And we have, um, this is one of those things where I need to go back and look. Like we're 50-50 owners of the house. And I believe that it says so, I mean, we, we have our own like operating agreement um, that's I think in our wills, I think like that's where we've also named our ownership of the house. So both couples, we all went out and we got wills made at the same time. Um, and so what we also did is we, I know some folks do like tenant in or like when you do a vacation home, right? With lots of different people and you co-buy a space and it describes your, your ownership. I think we have something like that um, in, in place. But basically what we did is when we got our wills put together, we also like willed each other couple. This is totally like off the charts. I think this is not typical in situations where co-living happens. This is like us next level. Um, and it's for a variety of reasons with all of our family stuff. but. Um, we actually set it up where we would will our assets and, and resources to the other couple if like John and I both were to tragically die in a car accident or something. Emily and Elijah would receive all of our assets and also become guardians of our children if they were still young um, and be able to have our assets for the sake of children. So it creates that stability too that like if something were to happen, um, the house stays the children stay and all of those things continue on. And we did that reciprocally with the other family as well. Um, so that's like really nice. Whichever one of us murders the other family first or just 
This will no shoot. This I forgot. This is gonna go up on YouTube. <laughs> but, uh, and it's, so I just want to like it's not that like like they would get all of our assets and keep them, but they become stewards of our assets until our kids reach a certain age. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in our wills, it does talk about too like if something were to happen to the other person. But I think that um, we just manage it where it's like 50 50 ownership, and then. Of course, there's the questions like, well, what happens if one couple gets divorced or what, what does that look like? And it basically becomes, you know, every person, well, we, I know we talked about this at one point. I feel it's like every person has their share, um, but it's share, it's managed like through each couple. Yeah, we did create an operating agreement that, um, which I don't know if that's, if that's something we, we can share, but that might be interesting for folks to see that yeah. at some point. And we also built into that agreement that there would be um, like escalation if there are disagreements that can't be resolved with the four of us. And we named community members who would be those like next level, almost like a, a board of advisors for us who would be that inner, inner, in between that and like going to get a lawyer that we would exhaust that kind of like advisor group first um, kind of like a mediator, but um, like elders, you know, our, our elder group in the community who would be able to advise us and give us really solid advice that hopefully we would just take that first um, before hiring lawyers. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of transitioned to another question that came in and something that I, I definitely wanted to talk about. Um, and that's about kind of the, like how the way that we live fits into sort of the overall life of the neighborhood. And so um, I, I will, I'll just jump in and say that I think that sharing resources, sharing a home, sharing like uh, the load with finances has provided us, has given us the ability to be more generous with both our resources and with our time when it comes to our involvement in the community. Um, and so an example is like, we are like, we're throwing a, a neighborhood block party on Saturday. No, no, Sunday of this week. Uh, that was Emily's idea, but like, we're all kind of like, show, like, like um, we're, all, we're all helping. It's not, not something our neighborhood has ever done before. It's actually, <laughs> people are like, what, what's going on? Um, but uh, I think it's like this, we've, we've done like spirit weeks for the, the neighborhood. Like we've brought in, um, you know, uh, like snow cone trucks and that kind of stuff. And we've just been able to get to know our neighbors in a really deep way. And it helps having the co-housing community right across the property, but it like being, uh, the, the commitment that we have to living in community is like spilling over outside of the bounds of our house and into, into the neighborhood. Would you agree, Kate? And what would you add to that? Yeah, totally. Um, I was just thinking some of the stuff we've described probably sounds, I don't know, maybe not for this group, like, oh, I, I could never do that. We hear that all the time. Like, that's nice for you. That's great. But like, I could never do that. And I think one of the things that John and I just keep coming back to is we think that more people could do this than even give themselves or give others credit for, um, you know, we share a lot of the space in our house, but we also have our own spaces too. And so, uh, you know, there's that, that way that we have figured out how to navigate a very communal living arrangement that also allows for, you know, three, two and a half introverts to be healthy and have their own space within a house. So um, I just think that especially these days with, you know, we talk a lot about the epidemic of loneliness that is happening, that there's so many more ways that folks can live a life together, whether it's just like living close in proximity to people like us, you know, where it spills out into the neighborhood or actually sharing a house and a space with other folks and then um, advocating for in your community for this type of living to exist, whether it's through um, like having more ADUs on properties, more duplexes, triplexes, apartments, condominiums, co-housing communities, like 
creative spaces, ensuring that there aren't um, codes or regulations that prohibit. I mean, we literally Googled, like, can we legally do this in our town? Because I know that there are some city codes that prohibit X number of unrelated people living in the same house together. And so um, making sure that those things like aren't on the books or get modified. Um, anyway, I just think that there's so much more abundance that can happen in living a life this way. Emily and I love to go shopping for things from time to time. It's usually plants for the garden. That's usually what we spend a lot of our money on. Um, but every now and then, if we want like a new piece of furniture, it's really fun to daydream because we'll start looking at it and then we're like, oh, right, half price. You know, everything that we buy feels half price because we're sharing it 50 50. And so um, that's just like, it's such a gift, especially in this stage of life right now. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, Elliot asks, is there an analogous alliance for co housing and co living, like uh, the incremental development alliances for local development? Okay, you're more familiar with some of the some of the organizations who are, who are doing kind of, who, who are some that you'd recommend that folks check out? Um, let's see. It's like Coho USA or something, co-housing USA. Okay. And I think there's like an international version of that too. I follow pretty closely the found, I think it's called the, um, foundation for intentional communities. Let me just see. I was just on their website before we logged in. Uh, yeah, the Foundation for Intentional Community is a really core resource for me, and they do a lot of webinars and um, support meetings and stuff for folks who are looking to like co cooperatively buy property or, you know, learn how to do decision making and all that kind of stuff. So that's my top resource. And they also, I think it's their organization that publishes Communities Magazine, um, which is kind of fun storytelling about folks uh, doing different kind of communal ways of living. That's great. And James in the comments says that the, in Canada, there's one at cohousing.ca uh, that folks should check out there as well. Um, yeah, any other questions that are coming up for folks? I do have a couple more here that I don't know if they came in earlier or if Norm, like Norm wrote these out. Uh, but any other questions that I've maybe I've missed in the chat? Go ahead and uh, you can even unmute yourself if you if you want. Um, yeah, one question I had, uh, I think just got missed because the reply was, is you're sharing a house? I was just wondering if you had to renovate or remodel oh, the house right. in any way to make it mostly like adding extra bedrooms. Because I have a similar experience. My my um, mother in law actually lives with us. Mm -hmm. And when we bought our house, we had an extra downstairs living room. And so we just walled that off and converted it into a bedroom for her that's on the ground floor. So, because she has mobility issues. So, that was something we did just turn a four bedroom house into a five bedroom. She's and she's really happy down there. So, I was wondering if you had to do anything similar like that. Yeah, our house is a 1968 ranch. And so, it's one single level and it's designed where it has um, small bedrooms on one end with a bathroom and then another bathroom on the other end of the house. And so there were four bedrooms on this end of the house and a converted two car garage. So the converted two car garage is um, like generic living space. It's not legally bedrooms or anything, but it was kind of divided into two rooms um, that were mostly finished. And so when we all first moved in, it was three families, these three families living in this one house. And so it was very cozy, but we were also like two fewer kids at the time. So it was a little easier to manage more adults, six adults and two children. Um, one of the couples kind of lived in that, their bedroom and living space, not like living space, but bedroom and storage space was that converted to car garage. So we have since, um, made that space more practical. And one of those rooms we converted into the teenager bedroom space. And so we had to do some work there, but the rest of the house was totally functional in terms of how its layout worked. Um, we had enough bedrooms where children could share rooms and we haven't gotten to that space yet where we have interfamily children sharing bedrooms right now it's still every 
individual like family unit has their own bedroom spaces our girls shared a room for a while um right now everybody has their own room but we think it's highly likely that in the next year um the other couples the young children will start sharing a room and it is even possible at some point over the next 10 years one of our kids and one of their kids might end up sharing a room but we've always been able to do like every couple has their own private bedroom space and um, we have remodeled parts of the house to make them better, <laughs> but we didn't necessarily change the structure too much for it to be functionally working. The, the benefit of the converted garage space affords us kind of this other little living, like living room. So we call it the playroom because that's where we have a TV and toys and art supplies. And that's like where younger kids can kind of make a mess, but it's not like the place that we as adults gather so frequently, which is just like nice, practical raising kids anyway, but it makes it, I think a little uh, more peaceful when you have so many people living in a house and coming and going to have that space kind of tucked away. The teenager's room has an exterior door access. And so that's blocked off and locked up for now. All the, all the parents in the house saying yes. Um, but eventually there is this hope that if um, college or community college in the future, can she can stay at home and live with us for, you know, free for her and be able to go to her first few years of college. And we would move that room around so she'd have exterior access and that's also down the road we're thinking like that could potentially be another space as kids grow up and move on that maybe we could even invite someone else to to be in there that is one of the things that we uh lament that we that we lament is that we don't have space for more folks we have a number of people in our life especially some folks who are in a time of transition, uh, some older folks, uh, even a young family that's having trouble buying here. I mean, she's again, she's a nurse. He's a firefighter. They can't afford to buy here. Um, and we just wish that there was more room and more flexibility in our house because we've had these people, relatives, friends, others who have said like, I wish I could be, I wish we could be a, you know, part of your community. Um, and uh, we do lament that we, at this point, we don't have that space. Mm -hmm. uh, we're hoping- yeah, we would totally pull up an RV or like a trailer or build another ADU or do something if that was feasible on our property, but mm -hmm. it's not at this point. Nick, you have a question or a comment? Do y'all live in a neighborhood or a, where you're zoning you, where you can up zone or easily add an ADU or- we can because we're in uh, be because we're in Oregon. They passed a law. I think the law went into effect either this January or last January. I can't remember. Um, so we actually now can by right add an ADU. Um, it's just a we don't have a we don't have a lot of yard space to um, to really do that now unless we convert my office where I am. This is in kind of an outbuilding, and there's a shed on the other side. So we have talked at some point about maybe doing something with with this space, but it would be legally possible for us to do that because of the statewide law that passed. Mm -hmm. uh, Sharon, you asked a question about our kids and whether they re refer to each other as siblings and they do. Um, they do with like a weird kind of, they're like, well, I mean, kind of, sort of, there's a little bit of that sometimes. And, um, but it's really sweet because we have two daughters who are 15 and nine. And then the, their older kid, who's now two and a half, they very much interact like siblings. We watch them and we're like, yes, they, they do. They interact just like siblings. Um, there's no differentiation in the like dynamics of the kids. They're just like kids who live together and do all the life together. And we just have had to figure out like, who do you call when you need help? Or what do you do when you need help um, with the little kids? And so we've figured some of those things out. and. I think that it'll be really fascinating to see the younger kids as they grow up and are able to start articulating what it's like to have our older kids around. But we, John and I have never lived alone 
when bringing a child home. So when we first brought our oldest daughter home, we were like co-living basically with my sister. So the three of us adults rented a place in Portland because it was starting to get expensive to live in Portland. And so we did that. And I just always thought like, I'll never, like you need all the extra hands when you have a baby. And so I was like, yes, like don't have a baby without a Libby. That's my sister's name. And so then we were pregnant when we got invited to move in with the older couple. And we were like, are you guys sure you want to do this? And at the time, their adult children were pretty much out of the house and they didn't have like, you know, they didn't look down the, the road and go, we're anytime soon, were they going to have grandkids? And they really wanted grandkids. And so by inviting us to live with them while having a baby and bring, bringing a baby home gave them the opportunity to like have this life experience that they didn't have imminent plans for. So um, our kids have always had other people in their life and now are getting to experience what it's like to see other little kids. And I think John grew up in a big family and had dreams of a big family. I wanted none of that. Um, I was like zero, one or two, maybe. So now it's like we have four, but not really four. So it's like, we also get the benefits of like having a big, lively, full, rich house, but also it's not all us. Yeah. And, you know, each couple every week, they, they get a date night because the other watches their kids. And so it's, it's good. It's good relationally. Um, yeah, it, it's, it is fun to see our kids, our kids like just love each other and to see our kids love the other adults. Um, it's, it's really special. And uh, even though our nine-year-old and the two and a half year old, like they have lots of little moments like mm -hmm. this, the moment they're out of town, or gone for a day, our nine-year-old starts missing him so much. She's like, hi, oh, when is he going to get home? I just want to play with him, which is like, I think the sweetest thing and shows like the true heart there. Yeah. She misses him like within 12 hours. Uh, yeah. Um, I, it's, we should, we should wrap this up, but I do want to say that uh, when, when Emily and Elijah brought baby Kelly home uh, or in, in the spring, the first time that Julia was holding baby Kelly, Julia's our nine-year-old, Kate asked Julia, like, what's your favorite thing so far about baby Kelly? And Julia said um, that she's so cute that she lives with us and that I get to see her every day. And so that, that's, that's really special. And I will say too, that uh, just kind of as a, to kind of bring it back to co-housing, you know, Julia, our nine-year-old, can just disappear into the neighborhood and just like, she'll be back in the co-housing community. All of the adults over there, they're like aunts and uncles and grandparents to our kids, to the Emily and Elijah's kids. And all of a sudden our neighborhood is walkable, whereas it wasn't before because of the co-housing community. And so we're in a fortunate space where we have our co-living happening right next door to the co-housing and that provides all of those other benefits. Um, and so, uh, yeah, um, we should probably um, kind of wrap this up. Uh, Ellie just asked another good question. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. So I didn't. I wasn't sure if I was going to mention this or not. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant. I don't want to turn this. Do it. Into I'll do it. I'm okay. not hesitant at all. Okay. So a lot of folks ask us questions about what we're doing and how this all works, and we love our life and we think it's super fun and, like we said, accessible to more folks than think it is. And so we've started a website a YouTube channel, social media to just like kind of tell the story of what we're doing. And um, there are certain aspects that like we haven't even delved into yet that we really need to figure out like, what is our actual legal structure? Obviously I'm not super articulate in that yet, but like I will be soon because we need to make that video. Um, but so you can see about our life here, we are starting to write blog posts. Like we love to cook together. So we're going to start sharing recipes, all those little things, but just some of the logistics of what we're doing, obviously through John Strongtown's lens, like we're all developing some of the language about how what we do can really make communities, families, places um, less fragile and just stronger all around and just better places for humans to flourish. And so um, feel free to follow along with our story if you'd like to. Thanks, and 
it's yeah. it's not it's I, yeah i wasn't sure if i could talk about that on the strong town well and i just would say elliot to your question like how do folks find each other like my experience has just literally been like i'm unabashedly like talking about it so when i meet folks i'll drop things like dancing rabbit like that was my thing you know 10 years ago 15 years ago and like people who know know so if you start just like whatever it is, like talking about those things, like you'll find those folks. And then, of course, through those communities, um, online communities, following different folks like the Foundation for Intentional Community is a great place because it intersects all different types of communal living. Well, this has been a lot of fun for us. I hope it was interesting for, for folks here. Uh, inspiring. If you have questions, like please, I'll always get in touch with me at John J O H N at strongtowns.org. This will go up on this the Strong Towns YouTube library. We have one more office hour session before the end of the year. Uh, excuse me, before before we take a break for the summer. We have kids in school, so I think of it as the end of the year. Um, uh, but so uh, one more session before that we take a break for the summer. Chuck is going to be talking next week about summer in a strong town. So that will be. That'll be a lot of fun. Thank you everyone for being here. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.